Hello everybody, uh, my name is Dr. Ildar Kanganov and um, I'd like to continue the series of lectures on music theory. Um, in, the, in the past two meetings uh, we have discussed music theory in general and uh, ear training or oral skills. Now I'd like to move on to the next subject in the system of uh, theory of composition, so called Compositions Letter, which is harmony. Uh, there has been uh, uh, some discussion of what to do first, what, what to introduce first, harmony or counterpoint. These two disciplines are closely related to each other and they are in fact inseparable. Although the history of counterpoint and the history of harmony uh, are two different histories, two different uh, profiles. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, teaching of harmony proper started in uh, the first third of the 18th century, and as our, most of our textbooks suggest, it's, it's, it's uh, the art of connecting chords building chords and connecting chords. But that's a very narrow definition of harmony. In this sense, uh, harmony, of course, younger than counterpoint, because counterpoint is, is at least 1,000 years old. More than that. Um, in the period which is uh, roughly called a Middle Ages or Medieval period, uh, there were some ideas on how to put together uh, a chant of several voices. There's a famous uh, place in the Tutus de Musica, which is used to ask, be ascribed to Hukbald. Now, um, we're not sure exactly who was the author of this treatise. There was an opinion that it was written by Hukbal, the, the, the one who wrote the Musica, Musica Enheriadis and Skolika Enheriadis, but it's very um, um, ancient story. It has happened a long time ago. So you would say counterpoint is 1000 years old. Well, here we have to clarify. The word counterpoint was not in use for the first, well, if it's the uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, well, for all these centuries, there was no word counterpoint used by musicians. Uh, and the history of counterpoint, since it's 1,000 years and very, very widespread geographically, uh, tradition that is not covered by a single definition. Therefore, I don't know if you, if you call music of Ars um, Nova Counterpoint, and then you call uh, music of uh, Gesualdo counterpoint. You, you probably don't, sh sh should not use the same word for it. And the general, the general word counterpoint, punctus contrapuntum, is, is, is very unfortunate. In music, we never deal with points, puncta, or with notes, which can be translated as puncta. We, uh, we always deal with something more horizontal, or melody. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, some of my older teachers uh, um, mentioned to me at uh, the conservatory in Moscow that it's, it's more appropriate to call this polyphony. It's a Greek, Greek term, very, very uh, uh, clear uh, in its, in its uh, etymology. So it's music which is written for many voices. Phone, voice, so polyphonia. And this term uh, covers not only European events of uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance, not only that. It, 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 polyphony can be found in uh, traditional Chinese music, in uh, folk music of Bashkirs, Tatars, uh, uh, just make, well, it's, 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 it's universal, it's global. So, harmony. In 
comparison with counterpoint harmony, and I would say something which probably is not completely and thoroughly uh, discussed nowadays, it's much older. Harmony is older than counterpoint. Counterpoint is just a particular manifestation of uh, the laws of harmony. Harmony goes back centuries and millennia. I would sound very old-fashioned if I say that harmony is 2,600 years old, and I'm mentioning Heraclitus and Pythagoras. Nobody, nobody would agree with this nowadays because there were other cultures before ancient Greek much older than ancient Greek culture. So I think it's, uh, the, the idea can be traced back to Chinese, Egyptian, Indian cultures, or Shumera, Babylonian. It's, 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 the idea is, is universal. And what makes it uh, so beautiful, that it, it applies not only to music, first it applies to uh, the universe, to the world outside. Harmony has played a significant role in formation of ancient Greek thought, which then was used as founding founding block for our European cultures. So many of them. The word harmonia is very beautiful. Uh, harmonia. Uh, the, the, primary meaning of this word comes from a building, from architecture, from, from co construction business. So it's a stud made of copper, originally it's a copper nail, big nail or stud, that holds together um, building blocks. Uh, originally it was wooden logs, so you want to place uh, one log on top of another, but there must be something that can keep them together. So, to fix these two logs in space <coughs> and keep them from rolling apart, uh, the Greeks used nail and they called it harmonia. And of course, then uh, this uh, habitual word uh, went, into the, went into the dictionary of philosophers and music theorists, and it has become harmony. By the way, it's a long story, maybe for a different lecture or for a different uh, discussion. But there was a, um, a substitution, a very str str strange um, event. Um, in music, harmony is associated with uh, Pythagoras and Plato. And Plato is a tremendous, it's, it's, it's pretty much a platonic idea. Harmony is a platonic idea. And Plato. Uh, through Socrates uh, refers to Pythagoras as, as his teacher. In philosophy and in, in other uh, fields of knowledge. So th th that's how harmony has been ascribed to Pythagoras. If you read fragments of from, from Pythagoras, some apophthegmata, it's called apophthegmata, some sayings which are retained in culture, in Dils Kranz collection, for example, uh, you, you will not see the word harmony uh, in, in, the, in the statements of Pythagoras and his school. Pythagoras used the word uh, taxinomy, taxinomy, taxonomy, which is order, orderly way of, of distributing elements. Uh, the cosmos is uh, taxonomic. The term harmony was introduced and coined by Heraclitus as as, as philosophical term, who was an enemy of Pythagoras. And in, in Greek culture, there are two traditions. One is major and another the is minor. I call it minor tradition. Heraclitus, ancient Greek Stoics, Stoics they, they used this uh, very strange, dramatic, explosive concept of harmony, which, uh, according to Heraclitus, was a war. A polemon, reconciliation of irreconcilables. And that's probably how it works in music. 
what is harmony in, in music? Well, if, if, if we just distance ourselves from uh, the category of chords and their connections, it's the work of musical materials that create tension and, and then relaxation of that tension, the resolution. We use the term resolution, resolve this interval, resolve this chord. What, what is being resolved? There's a conflict which needs to be resolved. That conflict is war, polymon. That's how Heraclitus is applicable to uh, our 18th and 19th century practice of creating chords, chord progressions. As such, um, harmony uh, uh, is, is temporal. It's, 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 it's not an abstract category that relates to abstract sy system or some kind of concatenation of elements. Uh, which can be visualized in form of a, a schema, a paradigm, a model. Harmony is a process. By the way, that's, that's what uh, has led uh, great thinkers of uh, 20th and 21st century to characterize musical form as a process. It was uh, Boris Vladimirovich Asafiev who wrote a book on that topic. And then we, we have a uh, uh, Janet Schmalfeld, who wrote extensively in, in the past on musical form as process, Music, she, she's using this term similarly. So it's, it's dynamic. There's another word which, is, which comes from Greek, dynamic, processual. So harmony develops. It's, it's like war. It's a, it events on the battlefield. You, you don't know what will happen next. But it's based on creation, creating tension and then resolving it, resolving a scandal. Tumult. Uh, so that's how it works. It is interesting, therefore, to discover the principle. The, the, and that's where we have to apply theory. Theory is not teaching. In Germany, uh, in German vocabulary, there is the word Lehre. Compositions Lehre. Uh, Stufenlehr, teaching of this, teaching of that. Well, teaching is it's like a cooking book. It can be uh, uh, some knowledge uh, in fragments, fragmentary knowledge, which when put together uh, works somehow. Theory is organized, it's a pyramidal, it's tree-like structure, uh, and on the top we, we need a, a governing idea, a principle. So. In order to understand how a musical texture work, how, how a musical organism develops in time, we have to figure out what, what is the principle that moves this thing along. Um, there were so many opponents of concept of harmony in the past century and nowadays. Schenker was very much against the 19th century or 18th century view of harmony. He was very critical about uh, the concepts of Rameau and Riemann. Uh, I have a strong suspicion that he didn't understand them. He didn't study music thoroughly. He didn't study music uh, in the formal environment. In the formal environment, therefore, he, he could not understand these concepts. And he has created something very similar to that. The idea is what moves music from point A to point B. For Schenker, it's a, some, some kind of visual paradigm, it's, it's a line, it's a scheme, it's, it's a model. For Rameau and Riemann, it's not that. It's the potential energy which is contained in a dissonant interval or a dissonant chord. By the way, what, what makes it more complicated is that we're dealing with the idea of chord, la corde. Let's just think about this. It took, if you count from Pythagoras, 6th century BC, and, and six, it, it, it took uh, 22 centuries to conquer musical materials presented in intervals. Interval is a very difficult, difficult category. If, 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 you, if you pass it through your ear, it's easy to understand conceptually in the university textbook, but to 
appropriate to adopt this, to incorporate this into, into your thinking. It, it, it takes years for every musician, in, and it took 22 centuries to realize for theorists, until Zarlino, music theory is dealing with four numbers and intervals, and other intervals were considered dissonant. Uh, Aristoxenus uh, considered dissonant intervals passing intervals. That's why we, we call them, uh, they call them diaphona. Dissonant was not dissonant. It's something that is that fills in the gap between points which, which represent consonant, perfect, uh, euphonous interval. Euphona, diaphona. So, toward the 18th century only, they were perceived as dissonant, as something disturbing, related to theory of aphex, it's, it's related to emotional reaction to the intervals. But in the 16th century, Zarlino came up with a scenario, so-called scenario. He added uh, two more numbers to our sacred four, so it's instead of four, it's now, it was tetractus, now it's uh, scenario, six, the sixth. And that included the major third, minor th or third, and major six, and minor six, and imperfect consonant intervals. Um, here comes uh, Zarlino's statement that uh, perfect harmony should include imperfect consonant intervals and, in, in, and distant intervals. Zarlino, thus Zarlino uh, has introduced something which was not present before, a chord. Uh, nowadays we take chords for granted, it's just a strum, black, big, whatever, but uh, theorists of the past gave this structure the name l'accord parfait. And parfait in French means perfection, of course, but it's also, it also relates to religious category, the theological, perfection, complete. It's something complete. As a, it's impossible. Nothing in reality is complete. Only God is perfection. So, so there are so many connotations. It's a beautiful category. Chord is the greatest achievement of mankind in music. And it took 22 centuries to, to just discover it. It was there in practice much earlier. It was there in practice. Guillaume Dufay wrote music which used chords already. The chords. And earlier than that. There were some chords. Maybe they were not triads, but there were some chords. Agreements. Chord is agreement. And triad is trinity. It's a representation of trinity. So, um, here it, it makes sense to uh, bring in the idea of emergence. As well. The bottom-up hierarchy. So the chord is more complex than the, the number of its components. Chord is not reducible to intervals. And that's where I disagree with Schenker, who reduced chords. He, in his graph, there is an attempt to reduce chords to tones of melody. This is a triple reduction. The intervals, and, and he, he went back from chords to intervals and to tones of melody. So here we are with this very complex verticality, which manifests tendency because there are some intervals the products of cognitive evolution evolutionary product everybody understands on this planet I had a friend at the conservatory who came to study at Moscow from the border between Vietnam and China he was 41 year old He's a warrior, machine gun operator. He's a soldier. He decided that he had to switch to music. He was absolutely clueless about elementary music theory, about intervals, chords, notation. But then I, when I played him distant intervals and constant intervals, he detected them immediately as such. 
even f for people from different cultures which did not use exactly these intervals in this fashion. It's very easy to perceive. It's because it's a product of cognitive evolution. It's, it's, it's very complex. So, and now core is the apex, the peak, the mountain. But th that's not... The, the hierarchy doesn't end there. So it's a tone interval with their qualities of dissonant and consonant. A tone can be dissonant in, in the key. Stable and unstable. This is something that we stop teaching. Uh, we have to teach stable and unstable tones of the scale to children from a very early age. It's very difficult. Uh, it's not given. You have to wake this up. It, it's, it's cognitive, but it's, it's not given. You have to train it. You have to bring it to the attention of the student. So, Re is unstable, Do is stable, Fa is unstable, Mi is stable, La is unstable, and it should go to Sol because it's unstable and it has the way to go. And T, of course, is unstable, it should go up. If you keep singing this scale, like Fa, Re, Do, Fa, Mi, La, Sol, Ti, La, if you give this with conducting to students every day, in the first four or five years, that will become part of a system, a binary system, part of language. And thus, uh, tone, interval, chord. And what crowns this? That's, that's the, the limit we have achieved, achieved. It's the function of the chord, which is different from the function of interval uh, related to its being dissonant or consonant. The function of the chord is something elusive. Daniel Harrison writes about this. So that Riemann failed to provide a, a clear definition of what is tonal function, although Riemannian system relies upon this idea. And tonal function of a chord is its potentiality, potential energy. There is energy in the dominant chord to resolve. 19th century composers experimented with that and they came up with a very interesting idea that you can leave that dominant sonority alone without the chord of resolution. It will be perceived as dominant that requires that resolution. So from Wagner to Scraben to late Scraben, these experiments ended with, with the idea of creating music that has no resolutions but has the dominant function. It's a tremendous evolution of the sphere of the dominant, as they call it in Russia and the Soviet Union. Too. So, these potential values of each chord, which boil down to three. Three values, three valencies. It's the valency of tonic, tonic tonicity of a chord, valency of dominant, which is dominantness of the chord, of any chord. There, are some, there can be substitutions which don't look like the chords on scale step 5, have nothing to do with scale step 5 at all. And subdominantness of subdominant. Here I, I would like to return to uh, a horrendous debate, which we have started uh, on SMT mailing list and it lasted for several years. Should we call it predominant or subdominant? We have to admit that the term predominant was not in use in the 18th and in 19th century. Nobody has used the term predominant. They were using terms sous-dominant, interdominant, uh, with different terms, not, this, the, not the only one. But nobody before Heinrich Schenker would use the term predominant. Heinrich Schenker placed this function uh, in a lower level of his structure. It's normally the, a, a, a note which looks like an eight note with a flag. It's not the part of the linear.
this may seem um, a, a, a scholastic question. Uh, how many witches can be placed on the tip of a needle? Yet, I insist that we have to use the term subdomain. Because it's not only the, something that prepares the domain. It, it's the function. It can stay there. It can go back to tonic. There are plagal functional cycles. And here come, comes the idea of a tonal functional cycle, which is probably the, the greatest achievement of music theory and practical achievement. Music is built upon cycles, tonal functional cycles. They move much slower than what we see in the score. The notation, the texture, factura, that is, uh, the, in Eastern Europe they use the word factura, the texture, the way music is made, arrangement. It's normally so that there are several le le levels, metric levels, rhythmic levels. Uh, this is a good example. So in this example, by Bach, from Brandenburg Concerto, number six, a slow movement, beautiful, beautiful, absolutely contrapuntal piece, I would say contrapuntal, but it's more harmonic than contrapuntal. In the composition, uh, we, we hear <coughs> figuration, moving in eight notes. Then there is a middle but middle layer of hierarchy, mid, middle strata, which moves in quarter notes. And it's, it's, it's the melody of chorale, so to speak. But there is something that moves in half notes. And that something is the pace of tonal harmonic function. It can be hidden in the texture. Here you can see it. You can hear it where it's happening. But it can be hidden in, in the texture. The texture can be of any kind. But there is something behind, below, beneath, above, and meta. I would like to use this word meta, like in metaphysics, the Greek, Greek idea. There is something transcendental, which is not present in the score. Function is not a character of any structure. It's something that governs and controls. It's, 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 it's like a detached control center. That's what's happening. Um, and these functions unite other elements. Here comes Schenker's favorite word, Einheit. He was absolutely right. Music is based on unity. 